the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tipsters with Melissa Morgan. My word is my bond, James Bond. <laughs> You've got a tip for Melissa, an old note you found in the attic from someone who lived there years ago, a photo in an old family album that sent chills down your spine, how to convince yourself that it really is more fun to watch another replay of the 2013 American League Division Series instead of going to an actual ball game. Tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. And now here's your host. If she hears the phrase new normal one more time, there will be carnage. Melissa Morgan. More cowbell. I actually think you're the one who's going to carnage it up if there's a, one more person says on social media, it is this probably is the new normal. Me. It is probably going to be me. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's not. I, that's not like a one that triggers me, but it was uh, very interesting to me that uh, Wes, who is a male, who was a yoga student of mine, uh, posted on Facebook, the next person that says this is the new normal gets punched in the throat. And then yeah. not long after that, producer Mark says the next person that says yeah. the new normal. Actually, I think you you were going for the nutsack. Yeah, it was it was gonna be much more painful than the throat. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was so, it was welcome gonna... to the new <laughs> but, normal. But, but it's spelled N U R O M Q L. Right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah. And uh, but no. If I, when I said that though, you began agreeing vehemently. I did. Be, yes. and, but I think because what was so interesting is that you know my beloved Wes, who's like this very calm Zen dude, just you know yogi and just you know he's like the next person that says a new normal is going to die. He is. He's like I, I remember Wes. I met him a couple. He had you dinner. Did. He had dinner with us once yeah, at that absolutely. Mexican place that we liked over there. He came to our um, Christmas open house. He's, yeah. he's been here a couple times. He's kind of. He's one of those kind of laconic, very you know, laconic dudes that kind of just hangs back. Uh, he does. He didn't see. It doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would want to you know kick somebody in the throat. He doesn't. It's been a while since we've practiced yoga all together and. I am a firm believer that it's difficult to do online, and yeah. those who can, God bless them. I am, you know, as I say that, I have a student who is extraordinarily tenacious, and she keeps saying, please, let's do one, please, let's do one. And I'm like, oh, I, you know, I'm considering it, but I just, it's a, you know, it's like movies. You can see any movie you want pretty much in your home, on your computer, it doesn't even have to be your television, and yet... There are, you know, movies I enjoy getting in the car, driving to the theater, buying a ticket, yeah. buying crappy popcorn that's ridiculously overpriced, sitting with a room of other people and either laughing at the same thing or crying at the same thing. It's it's an experience. Having a shared experience yeah. in real time with real people. And that's what I think yoga is. That's why I, I you know, have a hard time doing online classes. Yeah. Ever since I've started practicing, and producer Mark can tell you, People would come to me and say, hey, you know, I don't like being in a group. And do you have a video you could recommend? And I would tell them a couple of names, Patricia Walden or Rodney Yee. But the answer is no. You either give it a try in a group with other people who are, you know, um, awkward and having difficulty like you are and don't remember to breathe. And you either do that or you you probably don't want to do yoga i mean yeah, it's you know it's a tough thing especially in the current environment and and i i don't have any problem with people who like i don't know what this lady is asking you i mean if she just wants it on a temporary basis until we can all return yes to, it, that to me is okay but what the danger is to me is losing the ability to i mean losing the notion of of shared experiences i mean this is particularly right. true in the workplace i can see it happening already i can see that what's happening now with with zoom meetings because we're all having zoom meetings now right or there's different there's, form. There, yeah there's different there's different software that that you can use to do it but we're all having these shared virtual meetings where we're all looking at each other on our computer screen but it's it's not the same and no, i can see isn't. what's happening is that 
I think once everything kind of gets back going again that there's going to be far fewer people meeting in real time yeah. um it's gonna just it's not gonna happen especially yeah. you know when you would have to travel somewhere to go meet somebody at their office where they where they are you know and uh, there's uh, to me there's n no replacement for that there is to, to to take the time and trouble to go meet someone in their own environment um in a business setting is a big deal and it just changes everything when when you if if this is going to become quote unquote the new normal, no. please don't kick me in the throat, Wes. No, you know I I I think that I, and I think it is. I mean, you're going to hear you can already hear the the everybody saying that that I don't believe. Oh, that. we're not we're going to save so much money. We're not going to have to send people you know to meetings and whatnot. I just think that I think it is happening. I that kind of that just that's the kind of social distancing that destroys a culture. I it think. does. And, I and, and thank God we're old and uh, we'll be dead before hopefully it really kicks in. Yeah. I feel sorry for, <laughs> for the youth of today, but try to remember what it's like, kids, when you're older, what it was like to meet people, to hug them, to touch them, to to sit and look in their eyes, not through a screen, and see what's really going on. Try to remember that. Yeah. I don't uh, want to fear for the future, but I do. <laughs> All right, well, zippity doo dog. Yeah, thanks let's for bringing that up. Let's get on with the podcast. Yeah, so uh, if you want to uh, send us an email with a case to be covered or if you know of a missing person that needs uh, some light shown on their case, please feel free to email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can also call us on our tipster hotline at 832-847-7837 as several people have done this week, email and phone call, and I will explain what's happening and what I'm hoping to be able to, to help and do. And if you have some time, please go to Apple Podcasts and rate the show a five star if you feel like that's what we deserve. And if you don't, don't worry about this part. Uh, write a review if you are so inclined to explain what you like about the show or tell others what your experience is with the show and subscribe to the podcast. We would be very, very grateful for that. And we have received a few emails this week with post episode information. <laughs> I'm just going to call it that. That and, was a long pause. Yeah. That mm -hmm. was a breath. Uh, while we um, always try to include a number for you to contact someone in law enforcement uh, if you have information on a case. And, and we are here if you want to contact us. We understand that there are sometimes agencies, maybe you're located in a, a small town or you're in a city where you're not exactly trusting of your of your police force. That breaks my heart, but I understand it happens more often than I can imagine considering the amount of emails and phone calls we get and explaining why their local police agency, uh, they don't feel safe reporting things. So I have been thinking about this this week, and uh, producer Mark knows this also, but th you always have other alternatives. I do not suggest that your first line of defense is the FBI. Uh, it may be a case that doesn't f fall under the FBI, FBI's purview, but you have other organizations. You have uh, state police or highway patrol, or um, if your local police you feel are, are somehow uh, not up to par, no experience solving the kind of case you're talking about, or you just feel unsafe because it's a town where everyone knows everyone. You have a state attorney general. You have the Department of Justice. There are places you can go with your information. Please don't think that you're hampered by a small town or a, a police force that you, it, it breaks my heart to say this, but a police force you don't have faith in. And I, that's, we were all taught the same thing. The first place you go is to the police. And sometimes, you know, when you get older and you're involved in a case, whether it's a family member or, or a close tie, and you just don't feel that your local police, maybe it's years, maybe it's decades after, and you just don't feel like they can help you. It breaks my heart, but I understand. And there have to be checks and balances. There have to be places to go. And if you need help finding a place to go with information you have on a case, you can 
you can come to us and I will help you the best I can. If I need to report the information as you anonymously, I'll do that. I just want to say that. And it's not something I want to do. I don't want to do this. But I don't want cases to go unsolved because someone feels that they don't have any other option. And that's what happens. People sit on information because they don't know where to go. They don't know how to do it. And I understand that. I don't either. I'm fighting my way through this jungle with a machete with the rest of everyone. And sometimes I make a good decision and sometimes I don't. But I'm always going to be trying to make the right decision and to get information to the right people, someone who'll pay attention. That's what needs to happen in so many cases that, you know, you can't solve them all. But we can each do what we can do, one step at a time even. So I just wanted to say, if you need help, let us know, because it's happening more often, and it's, it's, um, it's breaking my heart. It's least, breaking my heart. Some of these cases we've done recently really do break your heart yeah. as far as that goes. Yeah. You know, it's that are tough. solvable that you, you know, I, I'm not an expert in any field. I am a bitch behind a microphone. But a lot of the cases that we've covered, we know are solvable. And maybe it takes a village. Maybe it takes you or someone you know reporting something that you think is small that might be so more important than you can imagine. And if you have trouble getting to your local agency, please know you have other options. Some of the ones I mentioned, and if you need help, maybe let us know and we can point you and to the best of our ability in the right direction, I hope. So I just wanted to say that. I know that's a, a big thing to say, but I can't help it. I've been not sleeping a few nights this week, you know, um, thinking about how how do we do this? How How can we guide someone to the right place? So... We'll do our best to just know that. So I want to also give a shout out to one of my favorite new podcasts now. It's called Just Science. And it was mentioned really briefly in the Netflix uh, series, docu-series, The Innocence Files, which talk about breaking your heart. Um, Overwhelming. (laughs) Just if you haven't seen it yet, I would suggest that you check it out. It's, uh, you know things like this and uh, producer Mark and a few other people in my life is the reason that I no longer believe in the death penalty. So it's things like this that are going to often give me pause about the justice system. And yet I had a big, long discussion with someone this week, a big, ugly, hairy discussion about the justice system. And it's, it's the best that we have right now. It's not perfect by any means, but it's the best that we have. And it needs a lot of help, a lot of tweaking. And again, if if someone's out there who knows something, they could potentially get someone out because you know they didn't do it. That's, you know, getting cases solved is the most important thing. But helping people that really need it, that are completely and utterly innocent, is... (laughs) Hi, Siren. Is she, another she agrees thing. with you. <laughs> Siren is always agreeing with me. She's uh, she's hanging in the master bedroom, shaving a spa day. Not really. <laughs> so Just Science is a really great podcast. You can get it anywhere you, you listen to your podcast. And it's to me, it's very fascinating, a really fascinating um, conversation with intelligent people about interesting things involving the cases that we talk about. And this case this week was not what we were going to be covering. We were going to have an interview with a private investigator about a missing person, a young man, 18-year-old man. And I got a email late last night that remains had been found, The not the um, outcome that we had hoped for, but one we knew was probably going to happen. He's been missing for over three months. And we will have the private investigator that was hired by the family. We will have her on. Uh, I don't know if it will be for next week's episode because everything is moving very quickly. They're waiting today to get his dental records to make a positive ID, but it looks like it's probably him. So that's why we're not interviewing her today. But we will interview her as soon as she's able to get everything together and talk. So I did not, this was not a case I had ever wanted to cover. And I will tell you why. It's local. 
and I didn't feel there was enough there there. I had seen the case covered by everyone and their brother and their and their dog and their pet hamster. But something happened this week where I decided this is the time that I'm going to cover it. And it's the missing persons case of Bryce Laspisa. And Bryce went missing very close to where producer Mark and I live in 2013, way before I'd started any idea, a germ of an idea of a podcast. So I spoke to a few people who had worked on the case during the search and rescue part of the case. And they have interesting theories. I won't name their name because it's it's their theory. In fact, most people I know have a theory. Uh, some cases grab your attention and you're not sure why. And Bryce is not a, a beautiful young blonde girl who's missing. So that's also an interesting component for me. He's a young man that had every right to walk away from his life. But some cases grab you and you're not sure why. And I feel like it's a a combination in this case, why Bryce's case grabbed people's attention. Bryce is unusual looking. He's a very um, tall, striking, handsome, bright orange ginger, bright orange hair that he kept usually really closely cropped beautiful light colored eyes, gorgeous teeth. And you know, he's not overly tall, not overly short. He's five foot 11. And he was a 19 year old man who was at a community college in Northern California while his parents live in Southern California and almost the Southern part of Orange County, almost to San Diego County and Laguna Niguel. And what makes the case interesting, I think, and what makes people pay attention is the unusual behavior of everyone involved to to the to the good and to the detriment um young people worrying about him calling his mom um him uh, behaving in a way that's unusual his parents being um somewhat uh problematic in their behavior it's it's a difficult thing. No one knows how to behave when a family member goes missing. No one. And it's it's a rare individual that becomes a spokesperson for a family that everyone can agree on behaves correctly, <laughs> whether it's a family member or whether it's, like I said, just a, a family friend who may be a spokesperson. No one ever behaves the way the press, um, you know, th- people who are paying attention to the case, no one ever behaves the way you're supposed to, the way they think you're supposed to. You exactly. Be- That's a great point. It really bothers me. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when you, and, and it's, doubly, it's doubly hard when the, when the person involved is an adult and the argument can always be, well, he, he or she may have just gone off on their own right. or There's something. No, it's not against the law to, to uh, change your life. And to get law enforcement in, interested in it, it's really tough. And if the family and the or the people that you know that c- could really push it forward are not reacting in in a way that's really helpful or at all, that's really but hard. What bothers me is that you're judged no matter what you do. If you are a spouse or a family member of someone who you, let's say you come home and they've met with a really uh, untimely, awful end, you either overreact and they think you're overly emotional or you don't react enough if you're under the, under the microscope of suspicion. You cannot win. The only time you win is if it's proven that it's not you and then later on, They'll uh, they'll interview a detective who was like, you know, I think they behaved appropriately. <laughs> right. That's it. Yeah, that's the that's best you're right. going to get. And, yep. and most of the time what you're going to get is you're overreacting. I think you had something to do with it. Or you're not reacting enough. You have no soul or heart. There's just no way, you know, to react correctly. But this case was covered by the investigation discovery show Disappeared. And it's not, it's not a perfect show. <laughs> it was one of the first television shows of its kind that I remember other than, you know, Unsolved Mysteries. And it was done differently in the documentary style, the way it was done. 
Occasionally there are reenactments. Those are really never great, but I guess it helps you visually to see what they think someone may have done, what the evidence, you know, shows. It's it's an interesting show, and like I said, it's not perfect. But what happens when someone is shown on television, whether it's in a documentary style setting or whether it's at a press conference with the police where you're asking for tips, everyone gets to form an opinion of you and, and in some instances judge you. And producer Mark and I saw the episode of of The Disappeared where uh, Bryce Lespice's parents, Karen and Mike, appear. And while they don't seem... I just, the only thing I can think politely to say is they're problematic. And I can't even explain why. There's, there, there, there is this gauze over them. Sort that's of. interesting. It's, so, it's sort of an intellectual, moral, spiritual <laughs> gauze that that's, you can't figure out if they really care or not. It, that, that's the only way I can put it. Well, that's an interesting way to say it. And that's, you, you are voicing what a lot of people feel, their opinion, that especially they think that the mother Karen was awkward. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to ever judge people because I don't know how you're supposed to act. Everyone's going to react differently. It's your child, your only child. And you, you know, your child behaved uh, bizarrely and you can look back, which I think happens. So many people are like, why didn't the parents just go get him? Which you'll see as the story is unfolds. And that's one thing that could have happened. I, there's a million things we can look back on. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? So in the instance of, of finding information on Bryce's case, besides the episode of Disappeared, which is an, an interesting, um, it's an interesting one. It's well done. It, it gave me um, faith in the LA County Sheriff's Department Homicide Bureau. Not that I didn't already have that, but they went to such great lengths. They had a lot of help with search and rescue, a local Santa Clarita search and rescue, because where Bryce ended up, well, where his vehicle ended up, uh, is very close to us, halfway between his parents' uh, home and his college. And I, I, you know, they sonar in the lake and aerial and ATV and two different search dogs, which came to the same conclusion. It gave me such faith that when someone's missing that they think may be an endangered adult because of their behavior, I was, I mean, and the detective, I don't know if he still has the case, Detective Martindale, he's very clear on what he feels happened. And I, I he, he is still yet respectful of the family and, and of everyone involved. But it is an odd thing in this case. And one of the things that I... A gift I feel like I've gotten out of it is finding a journalist named Julie Fiddler, and she has a blog called The True Crime Times, and she did a wonderful um, write-up on on the case for Medium.com, and she's a terrific writer. She's a really terrific writer, and she has a true crime blog. So check out the True Crime Times if you you know want to read things as opposed to listen. And I I love both both of those things. So we're going to go back to 2013 and go over this bizarre case that, you know, here we are seven years later and Bryce is still missing. So in late August of 2013, Bryce gets up to Chico, California, where his college, Sierra College, is. It's his second year. He's just beginning his second year. He goes up early before classes start. And he's in close contact with Karen, his mother. They have a phone conversation after his first day of checking in, and this is what's going on. And, you know, he's a talented artist, and he was going for some, you know, graphic design. It was more like the first two years he would go to a community college and then transfer someplace else. It's odd that one goes to a community college 700 miles away (laughs) or you know it's a long way away from where he lives community college is typically it's within an hour and a half or two hours of driving so it's that's why it's a community college but he was going i guess to get his undergrad work taken care of and then go on to you know declare a major i guess and the conversation he had with karen was a normal conversation and everything was fine That was on Monday, the 26th of August. 
So on Tuesday the 27th, Bryce's girlfriend, Kim, and they've been together for a while and are very happy together, notices that he's acting strange. And he finally confesses to her that he's taken a medication for ADHD called Vyvanse. I guess it can keep you awake, especially if you don't have ADHD. And he needed it, he said, to stay up and play video games and be with his friends. And his girlfriend was like, I don't think that's a really good thing. On Wednesday, the 28th, at 10 o'clock that night, Bryce breaks up with his girlfriend, Kim, via text. Uh, You know, I guess you'd be better off without me. One of those kind of teenage boy things, even though he's... Oh, boy. I know. Even though he's almost a grown adult, but it was kind of a childish fight. And it had happened before they'd broken up a few times, but gotten back together. Now, what comes out later is that the time that he spent in Chico before he went back to school when he got there early. A lot of that time was spent heavily drinking, heavily drinking. And, and he's 19. It's definitely, it's not something that is, you know, uncommon, but he'd, he'd been drinking for a while and had obviously built up some tolerance. So heavily drinking and pretty much taking anything anyone would give him. That's kind of, you know, what's, what's been said by people who were there. On that Wednesday night, some friends are worried about him, including Kim, and she takes his car keys away. At 1030, Bryce calls his mom (laughs) and says, "Um, they won't give me my keys. Kim takes the opportunity to say to Bryce's mother, Karen, you know, I'm worried about him. He's, he's acting strange. And Karen says, you know, he sounds fine to me. Give him his keys back. And Kim, right. Kim oh, does. Man. He tells his mom cryptically, I have a lot to talk to you about. And she says, okay, we'll go home and we'll talk tomorrow. What she doesn't know is that that night... That Wednesday night, he leaves Chico. And we don't know exactly where he goes for a while, but we know that at some point, maybe in the middle of the night, he's headed to his parents' home in Laguna Niguel. That is what is the overwhelming thought, the umbrella that covers all of this, is that he had put into his SUV's GPS his parents' address. They had moved not that that long ago, and he wasn't all that sure. So he put in their address and his GPS, even though it was a straight shot down the 5 freeway. Just the 5 freeway, for those of you not familiar, connects Mexico to Canada. It's all the way, you know, Washington, Oregon, California. It's it's a main thoroughfare for trucking, for drugs, for, you know, good things and bad things. But he was headed straight down, you know, to South Orange County, to Laguna Niguel. Right. From Chico, it's actually the 99 that goes right through Chico, which parallels the 5. And then when you get to Sacramento, you catch the 5, and it goes straight. There's no, there's, to go where his parents lived, it's a straight shot. It's, there's no weird turnoffs or anything. Right. Right. Maybe he just needed their exact address for their new for their new home, but he wouldn't have needed that till he got really close. So yeah, you're right. It's mostly freeway traveling. At nine o'clock on Thursday, the 29th, he runs out of gas at a very large rest area called Button Willow. When I have driven myself from Southern California to Northern California, producer Mark, who knows most of the roads in the United States from his travel as a musician for 10 years on the road, he would say, stop at Button Willow. So it's a big, a bunch of gas stations, a big truck stop rest area. A lot of restaurants. Places to eat, exactly. Yeah, Starbucks, Denny's, all that stuff. So he runs out of gas right there. Like, it's just, it's west of Bakersfield. He runs out of gas at this giant rest area. He calls a roadside assistant and a service person named Christian delivers three gallons of gas to Bryce and there's a $20 credit card purchase for the fuel. And that's at noon. He's not 
answering his phone at this point because I guess his parents see that there's a charge on their credit card for roadside assistance and they don't know why. So they're calling him and he's not answering. So that's 12 p.m. on on Thursday. At 12.30 the same day, Karen calls the number associated with the roadside assistance and gets Christian. And Christian says, you know, he's, he seemed fine. I mean, um, I don't know. His eyes were a little red. Hmm. So Christian actually says, do you want me to go check on him? And Karen is like, I, well, that would be great. That would be, if you wouldn't mind, that would be terrific. He goes and checks and says, yeah, he's still there. And Karen is like, what, what are you, what are you doing? I don't, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm just, I'm, you know, filling, I got gas. I'm, I don't know. I'm on my way. So later in the afternoon, Karen can understand that Bryce hasn't moved. And she says, what are you doing? And he's like, nothing. And she's like, get some food and get back on the road. You're three hours from home. Get, I'd say a little bit more, but she says three hours. And, you know, it's, it's, hopefully it wasn't a busy weekend because it was Labor Day weekend. So she thought the traffic maybe was holding him up, but it it really wasn't the traffic. He spends over 13 hours in Button Willow which as producer Mark can tell you is nothing. There's nothing to do there. And that's why there are so many outrageous theories that he's waiting there for someone. He's waiting for a drug dealer. He's waiting for a friend. He'd had a plan in place to leave his life. That was what he wanted to talk to his parents about. You know, he uh, was having a drug problem. He was having problems in school. None of that is, you know, really borne out, especially the problems in school, the drug problem, uh, speculation, uh, the drinking, the friends were very, very clear that he had really picked up the amount of drinking over the last few weeks before school started. You know, okay, he's 19. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, just because I didn't do shit as a kid doesn't mean that I don't understand everyone else did a whole lot of shit. (laughs) A whole lot of shit. So, I mean, I, I don't necessarily feel that he's a um, an unusual kid. I, I can tell you that, you know, they lived in Illinois and they'd recently moved to California. And he, as of July, like a month before, he had just recently completed probation. Uh, I believe it, it was for underage drinking. So he had, you know, been in trouble, sort of. I mean, in today's age, I don't even know how to call that really bad trouble, but you know. It's not that weird. Right. But here's, I mean, to me, it sounds pretty clear hearing all of this again, that he was, he had a drinking problem, that he, that he drank too much, but that the real uh, differentiator here, if that's a word, is the ADHD. D drug that he was taking, right? Thank which, you. Which made made him act just bizarre. Yes. And when you combine it with the alcohol, what was going on is he was having some sort of mental event, right? Because of the the ADHD drug. That uh, is the best point, producer Mark. That that's the theory that most people have that he had. A mental breakdown. There are definitely other theories we're going to be covering, but you're right, producer Mark. That's what I don't know a lot about um, drugs of any kind, actually. But what I've read is that the drug Vivance can um, produce, uh, I don't want to call them um, hallucinations, but I read a, a report of a young person who said, I took this as a young person and it caused me to have what my doctors called episodes, <laughs> which sounds like a, you know, an old thing in the forties. If a woman got the vapors, they were saying she's having one of her episodes. It's uh, 
he he this writer said that he was taking Vyvanse uh, for his, for prescribed for his ADHD and he would um, lose time um, see things that weren't there uh, have amnesia for a large part of a day or just completely sleep all day so this could have you're absolutely right producer mark not having ADHD and we still at this moment all these years later don't know where he got the prescription of the drugs. So it was a prescription. He didn't buy it illegally. No, no, I'm, I apologize. We don't know where he got the prescribed drug from. So either it w- it was not his prescription. Yeah, he bought it from somebody on campus, I'm sure. Probably. Chico, just so, so everybody knows who doesn't know already, Chico State is a party school. It's, it's I know, I personally know somebody who, did, <laughs> no, I know somebody right? who is, you know, very, very successful computer programmer now. Um, he writes, he writes code, if you, I think that's the current term. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he he went to Chico State, and he I think it took him seven years to get his degree because you you spend a whole bunch of your time <laughs> not going to school. It, there's there's lots of drugs, lots of booze, lots of places to go to just you know party, and um, so I'm not surprised at all to to hear that he got something that hey, I'm sure he was told. Well, you know, it's not speed, it's not meth, it's safer because it's a prescription drug. Right, it'll help you stay awake. It'll help you stay awake. To play to play uh, video games. To party. And for studying. <laughs> and to party, yeah. yeah 24 right. hour partying. At this point, we are not even sure how many days he's been awake. It's been, it could have potentially been 48 hours when he's still at Button Willow at the truck stop. He could have been awake for 48 hours. So that's actually a good point, too. It's, you know, there's lots of things that could have happened. Unfortunately, we just don't know what any of them really are. But we know that to, you know, his roommate, Sean, and his girlfriend, Kim, both called his parents, both called his parents and said he's behaving oddly. His roommate, Sean, said he gave me his diamond earrings and his Xbox his prized Xbox and said he wouldn't be needing him anymore. Things like that um, sound like what you do when you're getting rid of your earthly possessions. It doesn't mean he was going to kill himself. Perhaps he had a plan to exit his life. I mean, we just, we don't know. But his behavior, whether it was alcohol or drug induced and his, his, you know, there's a report that you know, friends said he was going through two bottles of liquor a weekend. It seemed like he would be more on the pills during the week and the alcohol on the weekend. And then, of course, there were probably days when he was on both. You know, to have his his probation because of a, an alcohol issue when you're 16 or 17, you know, that's that's something. It, usually those things happen and it gets expunged or, you know, off of your, off of your record. But, you know, that's his parents said when he spent the summer with us before he went back to school, we drank with him. <laughs> right. That's a thing that I, I don't understand. Sometimes there are parents that I grew up with friends, parents who were like, we don't care if you drink as long as you stay here at home. And they would keep bringing them beer. And I'd be like, Huh. So if you're not out driving around killing people, it's okay that your underage child is, you know, really tying one on. I just, I, I never understood that, but I guess it's the lesser of the evils. But yeah, the, the Las Pisas are very open about the fact that they let him drink with them. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know when you become the adult and when your child is still your child. I think they're always your child. Yeah, well, that. But st- I'm going to tell you that sort of behavior is not uncommon. It's not. It's not uncommon. I. I don't know that I understand it. You know, your underage child drink <laughs> drinks more <laughs> than you do. <laughs> I don't know. I. You know, how do they build up that tolerance? Maybe they're you know born. I don't, you know, he's he's adopted, which also makes a little. Um, a little bit of difference. I mean, they love him obviously just as as if you know he were theirs, but you know he's adopted, and he does a student film that at some point, if you have some time, it's like fifteen minutes long and it's not good, but it's called Family Secrets, and it's an interesting 
look into his into his world. I, it might have been the freshman year of college. I don't think it was his last year of high school. I believe he did it in his freshman year of college. And his parents play the parents. He directs it. He's not in it. And the actors are pretty... Uh, no, not good. Not, and not, no, not, not Emmy Award winning no, performance. Not even an uh, no, not an Obie or a, a Grammy or an Emmy or an Oscar or a, a Razzie. Not even a Razzie. They're wow. just yeah, they're not. It's good. even beneath a Razzie. It is, but oh. his parents are almost zombies, and maybe that was the direction he gave them. Uh, his dad at the end becomes a little uh, chew the scenery um, because he is kind of the bad guy. But these two sons, one older son keeps having dreams of a, a woman coming to him that it looks like it's from the ring, like she has, I think it's a, a boy actually, but playing his sister with like a long wig over her face. You can't really see her face. And she's a ghost. And she tells him, you know, that uh, that their dad killed her and and their mom, their, you know, their real mom. There were these three kids and and a mom and a dad and their other dad's married too. And it's his real parents. Oh my God. It's it's called Family Secrets. It's really you don't want to put too much into it because it's a student film. But you can find it on YouTube. It's um it's it's you know you're gonna have thirteen or fourteen minutes of your life where you're like what the fuck. But then at the end when it says directed by Bryce Laspisa, um, white letters on a black um card, you're like oh it it. It's a little off-putting. And I don't, again, I don't want to draw a lot of attention to it because it's, you know, it's a student film. It doesn't mean it's autobiographical. But it's, um, it is interesting, I'm going to say that. So he's this creative kid, yeah, obviously has some issues. Who doesn't at 19? Who tells their parents everything? Even though his parents are like, we have an open door policy. He would never do things without telling us he feels safe here. We can hope so. We can hope that that's what actually happened. So at 3.30, Christian from Castro Tire and Truck and Tire in Button Willow has seen that Bryce hasn't left. At 6 p.m., Karen and Mike, and you got to give it to them, they are not uh, sitting around. They're able to get triangulation from AT&T that shows that he's still in Button Willow. At the same time, they're finding out he's still there. You know, it's been uh, nine hours now since uh, he ran out of gas at 9 a.m. At, you know, at 6.30, 6 p.m., they're able to see that he's still there. And at the same time, Christian from Castro Tire and Truck sees that Karen had called and he thought it was recent. And, and it had been a call he had missed from her earlier when he'd gone to check on Bryce. And he calls her back. And, you know, she said, he's still not here. He was supposed to be here three hours ago. And Christian says, well, do you want me to, do you, do you want me to go look? And she said, I, would you mind? So this guy goes and checks on him a second time and he's still there. He's still in Button Willow. Oh my. This time, Christian says, I'm going to follow him and make sure he gets on the freeway going the right way. There was some talk that he was confused and didn't know which way to go. We could go back to the medication. But Christian follows him on the 5 freeway for about 10 miles. Wow, this Christian guy is a pretty cool dude. He actually was under the microscope for a while that, that he had done something to Bryce. Uh, yeah, I guess that would draw suspicion. Yeah, sometimes being too nice makes you, you know, a suspect, but he's not a suspect because Bryce continues on and we know he's fine, sort of, as fine as can be in this situation. And not long after that, the California Highway Patrol sees that he is pulled over and they wonder if everything's okay. They, I guess, run the license plate and see that, you know, um, he's had several events happening that people are worried about him. And he tells the officer that he just needed to pull over to blow off some steam. They do a field sobriety test, which he passes. 
and everything is fine. He says, you know, your mom's looking for you. And Bryce doesn't want to call his mom. He's hesitant to call his mom. That's really the only thing they report they have because there was nothing unusual about Bryce at that time. They so, didn't. So the Highway Patrol knew that people were looking for him. I guess so. Yeah. I guess he's pulled over okay. and they pull up behind him and want to make sure he's okay and find out that, you know, people are looking for him, <laughs> his mom. Well, at this point, it makes sense. It's he's been gone so long and we already know he's been behaving strangely. He was a button willow for nine plus hours. It's so. now 13 hours later. Yeah. It's 13 hours later, and the officer hands has to dial Karen's number for him. Says, your son's here. He's fine. And she says, what is he doing? And he hands the phone to Bryce. And Bryce is said, uh, I, just, I just pulled over, and um, I have to reload the car now because they checked it. And they did. They checked for drugs. They didn't find any. They checked for alcohol. Didn't find any. Took everything out of his car, his duffel bag, his backpack, checked everything, had him do a field sobriety test. He's totally coherent, according to them. Put him back in the car, and his mom says, just just get here. You should, you should be here by midnight now. It's 9 o'clock. You should be here. And he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get something to eat, and I'm going to do that. He, along the way, has stopped and bought a one dollar and 71 cent soft drink somewhere along the way and that's it that's the only other so no food too apparently. probably yeah and i don't think he brought anything with him so at 209 he says i'm really tired i'm gonna pull over and i should you know she said but you should you should be home like you know in in an hour and 45 minutes which I think that's actually a little, I think that's, do you think you can get from Castaic to Laguna Niguel in 90 minutes? Um, well. At night, at I night guess. At night you could. Yeah, you could. I guess. So this is a text that he's texting her now? Uh, no, he calls her. He called her. Okay. At 2.09 and said, I'm going to pull over. And she's like, okay, you've been, you know, driving and up for all this time. I think that's a good idea. So he was near Castaic and she she didn't know where that was exactly. They weren't sure. And it it's not a place to pull over and sleep. He pulls over, he pulls off onto Lake Hughes Road. And the next several hours are very odd and compressed. The other thing this case has going for it is the tightest goddamn timeline I've ever seen for something like this. And it was 2013. It wasn't 2020. It's 2013. And he doesn't have a whole lot of, he doesn't have a whole lot of leeway because he's seen, caught, known, talked to, tested all along the way. Right. Everybody, I mean, we know where he, uh, up until two, whatever this is in the morning, we know where he is. Yeah. And we know where he is after that. We know where he is until 4.30, which is the last video, and sometime between 4.30 a.m. and 5.15 a.m. when someone reports his car crashed. I mean, that's 45 minutes. And the highway patrol is knocking on Karen and Mike's door at 8 a.m. By 8 a.m., they know their son has had an accident and has walked away and is missing. Yeah. How, uh, what, where, so at 2, 2.30-ish in the morning, he, he calls his mom, says, I'm going to stop here in Castaic and rest. Yeah. I don't know where I am. He's very evasive, apparently. So. <laughs> Tell me a sign. Where are you? I can't see. It's dark. It's not a place you would pull over. So he pulls over at 2.16. He's seen on a camera that logs license plates around Ca Lake Castaic. Uh, State Park. He is seen um, at 429 is the last time that his back license plate is registered by the cameras. And at 8 a.m., sorry, at 515 a.m., a scant 31 minutes later, a uh, 
a runner, a hiker says, hey, there's a, there's an SUV that's crashed here. And what had happened is that he had driven off of a, a cliff and a 25 foot drop and the Toyota SUV had hit nose first and then landed on its side. Now there's a small amount of, small amount of blood, of Bryce's blood, small amount of blood behind the passenger seat headrest and a small amount of blood on the back seat, small. And the back hatch window has been kicked out. They believe that's how he exited the car. It's been kicked out from the inside. Oh, okay. Well, that would explain that why there's blood in the back seat. And, Very small. Yeah, yeah. Very small amount. Like what would happen if you, you know, were in an accident and you didn't get badly hurt, but you got scraped up. Right. So he kicks out the back window. Inside the SUV is his laptop and um, a duffel bag that had been opened. So something had been taken out of it, but his clothes... He had like a large amount of underwear and only two outfits, <laughs> but apparently he was going to be changing his underwear a lot, but only oh, washing. This is so weird. Mm-hmm. His wallet and his cell phone are laying outside the car. So he didn't take anything that, that would help to identify him if anybody found him. Yes. Now the way Detective Martindale suggests the tire marks is that He said it a couple times, and I thought it was pretty fascinating. He said he was blazing his own trail. (laughs) So it's, you know, he wasn't, he was going off road and it's it, it's in the middle of the night, you know, it's at 430 early morning. It's not light yet. And the detective said, from where you're up here, it looks like the lake is much closer. And we think maybe he just like, you know, if you're a pilot and you have the event horizon or, you know, you're not sure what's up and what's down. They think, Detective Martindale thinks, that he thought the lake was much closer, that he was going to drive into the lake. Right, that he didn't see the cliff. He just saw the lake. Yes. Yeah, sure. In the dark. In the dark, exactly. And and that the accident happened, and he was like, well, now here I am. I didn't get all the way there. There are no brake marks, no hesitation marks in the tracks. There are large boulders that were upended, unearthed, because he was going at a high rate of speed. It wasn't just like, I'm going to drive and then drive in here and slowly go into the lake and die. It was a high rate of speed. He was really digging up in that hard earth, big rocks. So that's, you know, another thing that's kind of odd. Two different search and rescue tracking dogs, two, tracked him from the accident site down to the main road and to a truck stop. And the scent disappears from there. Okay, so, God. So from the accident site, they tracked him to a truck stop. Nine days later, two different, at two different events, two different dogs tracked him down to a truck stop, and the scent ends there. So we know he made it back to civilization, uh, some sort of civilization. I guess we do. But we don't know what happened after that. Right. Now... As I said, this case reaffirmed some faith in humanity for me because of the sheriff's department. They used, um, you know, helicopters, horses, ATVs. Uh, I mean, I can't, you know, sonar to look through the lake. They, the lake, you know, there were a three-week search that was finally called off when they found nothing. You know, five days later, there was a, a terrible event that it was like, oh, no, it's him. And it wasn't him. There was a brush fire started a mile or two from where his his SUV was found crashed. And it was started by a burning body. And it was not Bryce. It was uh, a, a gentleman from South Los Angeles named LaMondre Miles, who was bullet hole ridden and set on fire obviously retaliation and they know why and how and who did that too but it caused a brush fire right by lake castaic and it wasn't bryce i can tell you because again i didn't want to cover this case that over the years we've lived here 12 years now that 
several sets of remains have been found in the area, and everyone immediately thinks it's Bryce, and it never turns out to be Bryce. It's not Bryce. So he's been missing now for almost seven years, and there have been sightings of someone who looks like him. And remember, he's unusual. It would be difficult for him to, you know, dye his hair and keep it because it's such a vibrant, bright red orange. It's, 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 it shows up in pictures like you can't believe. He has a, a large tattoo on his left bicep. You know, he, he's, he's unusual looking, not in a, not in a bad way. He's a handsome young kid, but he's unusual. You would see him, you would recognize him, you would know him. So he has been cited numerous times in the state of Oregon, somewhere between Portland and Eugene, a lot like a lot. So it's always in the in that area there. No, I'm I'm it's Pacific Northwest is a very big hub for um, homeless people and you don't get bothered. Uh, he's a very talented artist. He could do street art and make a living, but he people who look like him or him, we don't know, have been cited in the Pacific Northwest. But now recently there are six sightings from Dallas, Texas. Really? Yeah, but it's it could just be, you know, people who look who look like him. You don't, you know, it turns out a lot of times to be someone who looks like the person that's missing. Right. So we're seven years later, and I know Karen and Mike believe that Bryce would never, ever have walked away from his life and not let them know these years later that he's okay. They don't believe he would do that. And as a parent... I can't imagine. I would think that would be the only thing you could think that would keep you sane. But it's not illegal to walk away from your life. He took nothing with him. His parents were his sole source of income. It would be, they were supporting him in every way. It would be difficult for him to establish a new life. He didn't take out a large amount of money to start a new life. But, you know, maybe he is living completely off the grid, like he was so messed up by maybe the drug and the alcohol experience, maybe just, uh, you know, emotional issues, maybe problems with his parents that we don't know. Maybe, Maybe not. Maybe he had a plan, which is why he stalled so long for no apparent reason around Buttonwillow. He had a plan to meet someone. There are lots of speculation, rumors that he was meeting a drug dealer. I don't know why you would wait 13 hours for your dealer, and if they don't show up, what do you do? Yeah, I don't know. That sounds that sounds weird. I I think it I, does. I think he was just having an episode. I think that I think whatever was going on during that period, between the time he left Chico and the time that his car was found. I think he was having some sort of episode, and he may have been, who knows, he could have been permanently damaged. He, his, his mind could have been permanently, you know, fucked up. Well, there are, that's very, very true, Producer Mark. And there are theories that, you know, um, there are people who uh, have slight head injuries and end up wandering for years with amnesia. Exactly. There's, there are theories that he had a plan to meet a friend somewhere in, in Central California, uh, there's theories that he had a plan to meet a friend in Laguna Niguel and something changed in the plan. There's theories he was going home to tell his parents he had a problem with the ADHD drug, that he needed help. There are so many rumors that were going around about what could have happened that happens in a, a case like this. Right. And you know, the, and it's also occurring to me now that if he really ended up at a truck stop in Castaic, on the I-5, that, that, that he could have gone anywhere. He could have, you know, if, if he really had knocked his head and he had amnesia or something else was going on, he could have been picked up by anybody and, you know, taken, if, you know, taken up north. The 5 runs through the part of Oregon you were talking about. Maybe that's where he ended up. He could have ended up anywhere. Somebody could have killed him, could have picked him up and absolutely. then killed him. There's absolutely, Producer Mark, you're, you're making every good point. There are Theories that he met with, you know, um, an insidious uh, truck driver. Uh, There's theories that he was taken, there's a drug ring, and that he was taken to Humboldt County to work off a drug debt. 
that he owed. You know, I mean, these are a little outlandish, you know, and that, that he, you know, was working off a, a drug debt and something how he got killed there. I, I, there's all sorts of things that could be, and I'm still under the impression that he left his life. He left what he knew and is doing something different. If he is found, I will feel terrible for his parents, but I know the not knowing is the thing that's the worst for them. They probably have had to run through all of these scenarios and more over the last seven years. But I know that Detective Martindale feels that he is still alive and for some reason doesn't want to be found or known. And that would be up to him. It would be crushing to do that to your family. But because there's no other hard evidence and you have to go where the evidence leads you, you have to just assume that he's still with us. But if you know anything about the Bryceless Bisa case, if you heard something that you think isn't important, but could very well be, if you were in Chico at the time, if you were in Button Willow in August of 2013 and saw something that you think may be important now, or maybe not important, but really could be, please give the LA County Crime Stoppers number a call. It's anonymous. It's 1-800-222-8477. If you want to call or email us, please do so at jttipsters at gmail.com or call us at 832-847-7837 and more cowbell. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters.